Okay, let's get started for today. Uh, today we're going to cover uh, kind of the very beginning of talking about networking and network programming. Uh, hope everybody's staying safe. Hope everybody watched the last video, uh, the last lecture. If you have any questions, put them in the comments, send them via email, text message me. Uh, basically, I also opened a uh, kind of discussion board on the course page. Feel free to post questions there, or start discussions there. Uh, all right, so today what we're talking about is information transfer. And specifically, what we mean by information transfer is kind of this notion of uh, how do you send a large amount of data across some sort of a communication system. And in the process of doing that, how do you make sure it all gets there? How do you make sure that it's done reliably? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so looking at uh, what we're going to do uh, today is it's part of it is based on what we've looked at previously with error detection, error correction, but it goes well beyond that uh, as well. So let's look at that. So the idea is that what we're after doing here with information transfer is we want to and to know what to do when something goes wrong with error correction or error detection, we need to know how do we encode the data? How do we uh, react when there is an error that's detected? And then ultimately what all that is about is how do we ensure reliability of transferring that data? So the simple approach would be you send the entire message. So let's say you have this uh, really large file in this large file, you basically send the entire thing, and then you do a simple error detection on the entire thing. And then you say, well, did it work or did it not work? Was it good or was it not good? And the problem with that is that let's imagine you have this one large file that you send. If it's not good, you don't really have any recourse but to throw it out uh, and then re-request it and get the entire thing uh, a second time. So the problem with that is you say, uh, imagine you're sending a, a really large book through the mail and you basically get the book, you look at it and you realize that there's one spot on one page where the, it got ripped or where there's a, a part of it that had gotten wet and you can't read it so you throw the entire book away and then you request another one to be sent to you. So the problem with that is it can be wasteful. It also, if you have a lot of time and a lot of resources, you have like a load of resources invested in sending a large thing. Why resend the entire thing when only a small part of it might be the part that's damaged or needs to be resent or maybe it's missing? And so the idea is that we want to come up with something a little more uh, sophisticated. We still want to ensure reliability, but we don't want to do it at in this kind of unwise or uh, kind of way that ends up wasting resources in the long run. So... Why not send all of the data and then check it? Well, the reason is that, first off, uh, there's a couple things here. We talked about it being wasteful, but there's another case where you have streaming data where you can't really send all of it and then check it. So you want to, it's a continuous stream. It needs to constantly just be, uh, to have data going out. And we can't really check all of that because there's never going to be in all of it. The second thing here is if we have this large thing of data and we find an error in it and we send it all as one big block, then the only thing that we can do to respond to that would be to resend the entire message. And so uh, we could use some sort of forward error correction to fix uh, uh, things, but a lot of those methods require a fixed size block of data anyway. So we couldn't send the entire message and then do forward error correction on the entire thing. There are stream-based methods, but some of them not. So the idea here is it's a lot of times it's a good idea. It's beneficial. Uh, and to divide the message into smaller chunks or into packets. So what we're talking about is we have this really large message, and what we want to do is divide it up into these smaller units uh, that we're going to check uh, each time as we go through them. Now, one of the things uh, about this is that packets uh, are what we're talking about here. And so what a packet is, is a kind of this, uh, we said those, those chunks are called packets. And what a packet is, it's kind of a, a chunk of data. 
And that chunk of data out of a larger chunk of data could be a stream, it could be a, a file, it could be a some sort of uh, all of the data could fit in one packet. But packets themselves, this kind of block of data or chunk of data, we usually think of those as having uh, a couple of major sections. So one of them is a header. And what the header is, that doesn't have data in it about or the data itself that we're trying to send. It has kind of meta information, metadata about the packet itself. And we'll talk about some of the things that would be in there in just a second. So there's a header section that says, hey, this is a packet. This is the type of packet. We'll talk about the things that are in there in just a second. But then we have this data section. That's an actual chunk of the data to be sent. It could be the entire message or it could be a piece of the message, but it's actual data. And then at the end of that, we have some sort of check value or check data uh, or it could be a block of uh, forward error correction data associated with it. But the idea is that we have some sort of redundant data that's needed. Uh, and the purpose of it is to make sure that the rest of the message wasn't corrupted in some way as it was being sent. Or possibly to correct for those errors. So you can think of a packet kind of like an envelope. So we have this envelope. You're putting data inside of it. The header you can think of as what's written on the outside of the envelope. Who, where is it going to? Where is it coming from? postage and stuff goes on there. It's not part of the data. We're, we're adding additional things to that. And then the check value uh, doesn't really make sense with the postal analogy, but that's like saying uh, adding a, a thing inside of the envelope or on the outside says, here's how many pages and here's what the uh, summary of what's inside of here. So if parts of it are missing or the envelope uh, gets wet or destroyed, you can tell that something has been um, corrupted inside of that message. So with this packet, the, let's start off with a header. So the header, remember, is kind of not data itself, uh, as in the data we're trying to send, but data that encodes something about the data. So the kinds of things that would be in the packet would be things like uh, addressing information in the case of like a pa packet that's being sent across something like the internet. In other words, where is it going to? Who's it coming from? Uh, maybe a sequence number associated with a packet. Uh, meaning that if you have a, a really large amount of data and you divide it up into 20 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 packets to send them one chunk at a time, then we need to be able to put them back into the same order that we uh, split them apart by. So there's usually a sequence number. So that sequence number might be this is packet one, this is packet two, packet three, or it could be based on the amount of bytes that are in the packet. This is uh, the sequence number, but they usually... Uh, kind of increase as we go through the packet, and it's a way to put the packets back into the right order when they're received. So imagine you have a book, you want to uh, send, let's say, 300 pages through the postal system, and all you have are uh, small letter-sized envelopes. You might stick one page in each envelope, mail all of them. But when you receive it, you need to know how to put it back together, so you need to have sequence numbers associated with that. All right, also there might be some version information as to the type of packet it is, there might be some information as to what version of that type of packet it is, so you can make sure that the person receiving it knows what set of rules to use to put it back together. There might be some other stuff in there that we'll see uh, later on when we get into uh, actual TCP IP packets across the internet or even Ethernet packets, uh, things that relate to the size of the packet, how much data is in it, what's the routing information uh, that goes with that packet, things like net masks. Uh, also routing, you could think of port numbers as being associated with that, flags uh, that indicate something about the packet, and some sort of fragment data if the packet needs to be further divided at some point. We'll talk about that stuff later on. But the main conceptual thing here is think of it as the what's on the outside of the envelope. If there's stuff on the outside that's required for it to work with the postal system, you have to say who it's going to. Most people say who it's coming from. You have to put postage on there and it won't work without you doing uh, that set of things. So again, the header is not data as in the data we're trying to send. It's data about the data or data about the packet itself. All right, the data section. Uh, the data section uh, could just be some data. It could be uh, include forward error correction encoded data along with the data, kind of interleave with it. It might be uh, encrypted in some way. Uh, but the data section of a packet is usually called the payload. So the payload is kind of the thing that we are carrying uh, in the packet, not part of the 
uh, kind of surrounding structure of the packet. So think of that as the papers or information that is inside the envelope, not on the outside. All right, now the last part that we talked about was this check value uh, or the check data section. So that will contain some sort of value or some sort of data that's used to check the integrity of that. And what we mean by that is the concept there is relatively straightforward in that we, when we receive that packet, if it gets corrupted, we don't want to use that. This is the whole point of this is to make sure we have some sort of reliable transfer here. And so the idea is we need, if we're going to check the reliability or the integrity of that packet, we need something to check it against. And that's what the uh, check value is going to be. So in our case, that's usually something like a CRC value. Um, it could be uh, something more complex like forward error correcting code blocks. Uh, it could also be, um, it could, it may or may not include the header itself. So the header might be part of the uh, check calculation, check data calculation, or it might not. It could just be the data portion of it. But the idea there is that we want to make sure that what we received in the data or in the packet is what was sent. Now, those three parts, every packet can be kind of thought of as having those three parts. And we're going to see this time and again when we look at different protocols uh, moving forward here. So looking at uh, kind of an overview of that, we get this picture up here. So up here, notice that we have kind of the header is usually first in the packet. That's the thing that comes across first. And then the payload. And then the check value at the end. And the reason why the header is first is because a lot of times it'll have things like Here's how much data it is, and it's also the routing information. But notice the data stored inside of there really is a lot like an envelope. It's kind of surrounded by this structure that's not data that you can think of as the outside of the envelope and then something that summarizes what's in the envelope so we know that if this gets damaged or destroyed or lost, uh, overwritten by something, corrupted in some way, that we can verify that it's correct and the header has information that's used on the outside. And we're going to see that concept of kind of wrapping data inside of this kind of packet structure. Uh, think of it like uh, you take your your papers, you stick them inside the envelope, and you add some stuff on the outside of that. So now, one thing to the, no, note here, though, is if this is just a string of bytes that are being transmitted, we have to know when I get to the end of the payload. When is it, the t when is it time for the check value? So if these are just coming in one byte at a time, we need to know that's where the data ends. That's where the check value begins. And there's a couple ways that you can do this. There's several ways you can do this. Uh, one of them is predominantly used, but you could use fixed size packets. So in other words, you could say, hey, every packet has this much um, payload. If every packet is the same length, let's just say arbitrarily, every packet has 32 bytes of payload that are allowed, and that's it. And every one will be exactly that number of bytes. Now, uh, Another thing would be to have what's called a data delimited packet, meaning you have some special character that says this is the end of that uh, packet. So if you think of that like a, a sentence. We have a sequence of uh, letters and spaces and other things, and then it ends with like a end punctuation, like a period or an exclamation mark that says this is the end of that sentence. We could do something similar with our data where we say, okay, include everything up to this special character. Maybe that special character is a, uh, a new line character. Maybe that special character is a null character, something that says that's the end of the data. And then there's one other option, and that's what's called size field delimited. And what size field delimited does is it has a special uh, kind of field in the header that says this is how long the packet is. So in other words, the header might say, uh, again, the header has information about it. It might have the sequence numbers. This is packet one, and packet one is going to be, let's say, 92 bytes long. And then there, that counts off then how many bytes there are until we get to the end. Now, what problems do each have, and which is most used? Uh, and I suppose, what problems would we have with a fixed size packet? So if we let's start with that one first. The problems we have with that would be that well, if we have a message or a packet size that's smaller than that fixed size, then we're going to end up with extra data being sent that isn't really part of the message. And then we have this problem of like, well, how do we know if it's always 32 bytes and then we have a less than that? How do we know which part is extra and which part is actually part of the data? And so now we have to figure out how do we know where the cutoff point is anyway. Otherwise, we're going to end up with things. So this will... 
fixed size packets are sometimes used in, especially like wireless networking systems, uh, things like that, uh, that are fairly low level to say it's always 32 bytes. So it's always 128 bytes. Uh, there are some other systems that use fixed size packets for kind of industrial control systems and things like that. But they do have this disadvantage of you don't know where which part of that payload is data and which part is uh, padding that's added just to come up to the fixed packet size. So unless the data we're trying to send is a multiple of the packet size, then we're always going to end up needing padding at the end. And that can create uh, difficulty. And then it also can be wasteful if we send a whole lot of little tiny packets with a very small amount of data, we're spending time sending stuff that we don't need to. So those are the two uh, kind of problems with fixed size packets. The good thing about fixed size packets, fairly easy to implement. You don't have to worry about how much uh, to allocate for the packet size. You don't have basically you just say always read the same amount, and then you the check value is right after that. So there's no logic involved other than counting up to the fixed packet size. Now a data delimited packet, you can have that be variable length. It can be shorter, it can be longer, because uh, it's always ending with a special character. In other words, it's always going to be a special character right here on this end part, uh, right before the check value. But the problem with that is we need some kind of special character or a special sequence of characters to say when we're at the end. And in order to uh, for that to work right, we have to reserve that character and make sure that it does not appear in the rest of the uh, payload somewhere. And while if you're just sending, like, for example, ASCII, you could say, well, a null character won't really, really appear in an ASCII string, uh, like a text string. But if we just start sending arbitrary uh, data from, like, an executable file that we want to transfer or uh, some sort of other arbitrary, like, binary file format that has some sort of data in it from a uh, database or something like that, then we wind up with this problem. Like, what if that special character just accidentally ends up as part of the data? Then we're going to prematurely end the uh, the packet. We'll treat what follows that, which is really data, as a check value. It'll come up wrong. And we'll retry it. And it'll never work because we're always going to run into that thing. So if you have a data delimited packet, you have to guarantee that the end sentinel character is not part of your data or payload. And if it is, you need to have some method of escaping that or having an escape sequence uh, to allow that to appear. And then if you do that, then you have to make sure that the escape sequence doesn't appear in the data. And so you wind up with uh, this case where it winds up being difficult because you have to control what shows up in that data payload section. Uh, and sometimes that can be not as uh, easy, uh, the cat is back again here, not as easy as one would, uh, one might think it would be. Now, also it's additional processing now we have to do to do that. Now the one, uh, the size field, the limited one, basically we added an extra field in the header and that specifies the size of the payload. Now, essentially what that, the main disadvantage of that is that we just have some extra data we have to send in the form of this, uh, extra maybe byte, could be a few bytes, could be, uh, depends on what maximum size we want to have for that payload. But, oh, don't bite me. Uh, but we have this uh, case with the size field delimited packets where uh, the we are spending some extra time on overhead. Then we've made the header a little bit bigger. But that's the one that's used most often. The size field delimited is used most because it doesn't have those limitations of the other two that we can have a variable size uh, payload. We can change it, scale it up or down as needed. And then we also don't have to worry about escaping parts of the data or ensuring that the data uh, is not uh, kind of, does not include some special character. We put arbitrary data in there. And the only cost we have associated with the size field is a, a little bit of extra data that we end up putting in the, uh, uh, the header. So it does have a little bit more overhead because of that. But we also don't have to worry about escaping things out of the packet or padding uh, data. All right, most used one, size field delimited. All right, so now that we have this concept of packets, we have to know what do we do with those packets? How do we use them? And in order to uh, do that, we essentially need this uh, 
what I would call a set of rules uh, for that. And for to have this set of rules, again, think back to the kind of postal system. That with the postal system, there's a uh, essentially a way that you have to go about uh, doing things. Hold on one second. Okay, we had a technical issue there because the cat pulled the cable out. Okay, now, with the set of rules uh, for the postal system, having letters isn't enough. If you just put things in envelopes and then write some garbage on the outside of the envelope and throw it in a box, it's not necessarily going to uh, get where you intended it to go. You have to follow the rules that the postal system has for that. In other words, when you have an envelope, so you've got an envelope, you have to put the uh, who it's going to in the right location. It has to be kind of on the middle of the envelope. You have to put the return address kind of in the top left corner. You have to put the postage in the top right corner. If you violate any of those rules, like for example, if you put who it's going to in the top left and your return address in the middle of the envelope, it's going to just come right back to you. It's not going to work right. So we have to have the set of rules that we follow. The other thing is uh, we need rules for what happens if uh, that are kind of above those simple how do we make a packet and how do we format it properly. We need rules that say, what do I do when a packet is missing? Or what do I do when the checksum of a packet, the check value of a packet comes up incorrect? Uh, what are the rules that I follow to address issues when they arise? How do I send the initial packet? Uh, how do I send the one that says, now I'm done? This is the last one. So we need this set of rules that govern kind of Use the, how do we create the packets? How do we use them? How do we route them? How do they get delivered? When I have them, what, how do I respond if there's a problem? And both the sender and receiver have to be kind of uh, in agreement on that set of rules. Now, that set of rules is called a protocol. And if you think of the word protocol, like a diplomatic protocol or uh, something along those lines, it's really just like a set of uh, guidelines or rules or... Uh, uh, like you think of like any kind of protocol is this kind of set of uh, items or a list of rules that you are to follow. And that's the same thing for information transfer. All right, so protocol rules, what are in, what kinds of things are included in those rules? Well, generally we have like a, the format of the packet. That's an important part because if we put the wrong thing in the wrong place, whoever receives it isn't going to understand it or maybe even a system along the way isn't going to understand it and it's not going to be able to make sense of it. So what's in the packet and where is it in that packet? A second rule will be rules for synchronization. And what that means is uh, how do we make sure that the stream, if we have a large amount of data that we have to break up into smaller packets, how do we make sure we put it back together into the same sequence uh, that it started with? And that requires sequence numbers, uh, What's the syntax of the sequence numbers? What's the semantics of it? What, is the number, what do the numbers mean? Are they byte-based? Are they uh, just integer count-based? And so we need to agree on that on both ends. Also, we need rules for connecting. In other words, how do we get a sequence started? We need rules for putting addresses and how to things get routed and delivered. We might need rules for uh, stimulating and maintaining the flow of the packets, meaning what if the receiver says, hold on a second, I, I you're sending me too much data too quickly. We need a way to pause uh, the transfer process. We need a way to resume it. We might need a way to abort it to say, you know what, never mind, I don't need that anymore, stop. Uh, or there was an error, stop now. Um, we also might need, uh, speaking of errors, rules for how do we detect there? How do we compute the check value? Is it a CRC? If it is a CRC, what's the generator? Uh, or if something goes wrong when I do detect an error, how do I re-request the data that was missing? And in other words, how do I recover from an error to kind of resume the process? And that involves kind of two different concepts, one called timeouts and one called retries. So for example, if you're waiting for the next packet to come in and you never get one, how long do I wait before I say, hey, I never got that thing I was waiting for? And then again, if something fails and you get an error, how many times do you retry that? Do you say, okay, try again, try again, try again? Because you don't want to be stuck in an infinite uh, loop if something is going to continue to go wrong. Uh, the last rule there we have is rules for kind of 
ending the sequence? How do we stop it to finalize things? Just like we had to have a rule for starting it or connecting, we need to have a rule for disconnecting or stopping the sequence. And that could include uh, terminating the sequence by uh, aborting it, but there needs to be some process by which you say we're done with this particular uh, transfer. All right, so again, think of back, back to that postal system in a book has a lot of pages. We want to send it from one place to another place in chunks, and we want to put it back together so it looks exactly like it did when we started. What Clearly, there needs to be some kind of methodology involved there, and that methodology is governed by the rules of what we would call a protocol. Okay, protocol standards. Uh, we could make our own protocols for things, uh, and people do. Uh, uh, my product, cat attack. <laughs> Sorry, the cat just bit my hand. Um, there are rules for uh, that you could create for your own protocol, and those those rules uh, you can make them up how you want, as long as you kind of handle these things that you need for your system that you're designing. But there are standard ones as well that have been created for us. So for example, Ethernet is a uh, kind of networking standard. It has uh, Ethernet packets and a certain process that you use to create the packets and send the packets. Um, so if you have like a, uh, also Wi-Fi could be on here, wireless uh, Ethernet. There are various standards for that. Those are, those standards involve a protocol as well. How do you uh, like uh, with Wi-Fi, how do you detect a network? How do you connect to it? Uh, how do you disconnect from it? How do you transfer data across it? All those are protocols with sets of rules in those standards. But there's a set of other ones here as well. We've got like TCP IP, uh, which is kind of the networking standard for the internet. We've got HTTP, which is kind of how the World Wide Web works when you request a web page. Uh, HTTPS, which is a secure version of that, which has its own protocol that sits on top of HTTP. Now, one thing to note is these protocols can be layered, meaning that HTTP and HTTPS use TCP IP, and then TCP IP has to sit on top of some other kind of network, uh, like Wi-Fi or Ethernet. So they can kind of work together. In other words, you can push data in HTTP format with the HTTP protocol over TCP IP, which then makes packets that go out over Ethernet. And we're going to talk about that kind of layered approach here uh, uh, next class. But today, just note that these aren't just all used independently. Ethernet is a lower level protocol for getting data onto a physical network. TCP IP is more of a logical protocol that sits on top of a range of possible lower level networks, Wi-Fi versus Ethernet versus uh, Fiber, FDDI, or something on the lower end could even be on top of, uh, if you have like a, a home network, it might be uh, a cable modem, uh, or it could be DSL, it could be, there's a lot of stuff that could be down here, but HTTP and TCP IP can still work over that. Uh, FTP is the same way, file transfer protocol, uh, with email, POP, or IMAP, uh, both of those are kind of uh, protocols that involve email, which incidentally works over TCP IP over Ethernet. Um, Telnet or SSH, those are kind of remote login protocols to log into a server and get like a, a command prompt and a shell uh, from that. Uh, SSH is secure shell. Also, there are protocols for remotely copying files from one system to another system, just like you would copy a file on your local uh, system to some location. You can do that remotely with RCP or SCP. SCP is like a secure version of RCP. And then even the uh, the way that your uh, smartphone connects to uh, the kind of cell tower, the way when you say make a phone call or send a text message, uh, the for example, SMS is another one I should probably put up here, but those deal with global systems, uh, or GSM is a global system for mobile communications. Uh, SMS is kind of the text messaging uh protocol, but there's tons of these protocols. In other words, it depends on the application of what we're trying to do, but they can work together as well. All right. Now, the this was a relatively uh, short lecture for today. Uh, our next class, uh, we're going to dig into kind of the TCP IP 
programming. So we're uh, let me go back to this list of protocols here for a second. So we have uh, kind of Ethernet, TCP IP, and then HTTP on top of that. We're going to spend some time on this Ethernet and TCP IP programming side of things next class. And then I'm going to give you guys uh, a lab to work on related to that. But the idea here is that we want to very quickly get it into learning a couple of these standard protocols, how they work behind the scenes. But then we're also going to look at how are we going to write our own code that inter interacts with those. So we're going to write our own programs that can talk to other programs on the Internet. And we're eventually going to implement some of these higher level protocols up here as well on top of what we implemented down here. But the, the key to being able to write code for uh, TCP IP starts with understanding how protocols work and specifically how do we make packets for that. And so that's what we're going to look at uh, next class. We're also going to look at the layered kind of approach to this stuff next class as well. Uh, so this was a relatively short lecture. Uh, let me know kind of in the comments. I'll probably post something that allows you guys to decide whether or not um, we want to continue with the video lectures or whether you'd rather have uh, something more traditional. Um, but we'll decide that next class. But that's it for right now. And we'll go ahead and stop there. And I'm going to kick the cat out of the room because it keeps biting me. All right, so stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll talk next time.